Please consider supporting Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Beach and Creative Control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Beach's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends. Uh, but the truth is, he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up and coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as though he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Vish's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. Steve Von Till is an accomplished musician, lyricist, poet, and elementary school teacher currently based in Spirit Lake, Idaho. Well known for his role as a songwriter, guitarist, and vocalist in the band Neurosis, as well as running the fiercely independent label New Rot Recordings, Von Till is also a prolific artist in his own right. Working under the banner Harvest Man, and also under his own given name, Von Till's solo work is often gentler but no less intense than the punk-infused metal of Neurosis, and his lyrical explorations are equally introspective and philosophical. In that vein, Von Till has just issued his first book, Harvest Man, 23 Untitled Poems and Collected Lyrics, as well as a riveting new solo album called No Wilderness Deep Enough, both of which are available now, via New Rot Recordings. Steve and I recently connected for an extensive conversation about his role as a teacher working for an education board grappling with a pandemic, his interests in poetry, philosophy, and mythology, the power of punk and escaping genre pigeonholes, his new poetry collection and solo record, future plans for Neurosis and New Rot, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you, who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control and Massey Hall's concert film series live at masseyhall.com where you can stream dozens of 30-minute films for free including performances by past podcast guests like members of Rio Statics plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 561st episode of Creative Control, featuring the multi-talented Steve Von Till with your host, me, Vish Khanna.
stories we tell ourselves. Hi, Steve. How's it going? Good. How are you, Vish? I'm well. I'm well. It's nice to have you on the show. Uh, where in the world are you? I am in my home studio in the barn out outside my house in uh, Spirit Lake, Idaho, north of Coeur d'Alene. Ah, I see. How are things going in Idaho and America from your perspective <laughs> at the moment, given the uh, dual, at least two calamities that I can think of? There's the pandemic as we're speaking. Uh, there's also the uh, social unrest. How are things going in, in, in Idaho? Well, it's definitely a strange place to be. Um, with regards to most of it, you know, we live on 12 acres of forest. So if you turn off the news and don't go to town, days can be no different than any other day. Hmm. But as soon as you hit town and you realize that even the idea of uh, wearing a mask to protect your uh, fellow citizens has become politicized, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's just crazy. It's insanity. I don't know. I don't know what the hell's going on out there, but it, it doesn't feel good. Any of it. I involuntarily chuckled as I've been doing, uh, talking to guests about this super serious stuff. And, uh, that is a reflex that I've, I acknowledge in myself. Are you able to laugh this off in any way you use that you invoke the phrase i think insane or insanity like there's this sense that this is absurd but are you processing it on any other intellectual or emotional level or is it simply well this is just the way it is here right now kind of all of it i mean sometimes even if you choose to ignore the shit show in the media for you know some days it, I just feel like the energy in the air is very um, thick. Hmm. You know, like when you have this many people globally stressed out and worried about health, about money, about how to survive, you know, especially in our independent music world, anybody whose way of earning a living had to do with uh, live music is, is just hosed. And America doesn't have much of a safety net for folks. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, and you you know, parents and elder people are worried, you know, and, and, uh, the way isolation interacts with people's, um, mental health issues or what have you. I think it's, um, I don't know. It's just intense and the level of information and disinformation. I, I'm an elementary school teacher for my day job and just in how our community is planning on starting the school year is a very stressful and contentious thing to be involved in, you know? So it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're as parents, so I'm, uh, uh, we're, we're parents here and we are just getting slow trickles of information from, uh, our provincial government here and the, uh, educational boards. And it's, uh, inconsistent. And to me, <laughs> yeah. it's a little, yeah. it's a logical, it doesn't seem, to I don't understand the constant lack of foresight like I I don't that's where I'm at I we keep seeing people make mistakes and not learn from them which I think in your talk you, you were talking about the energy in the air and I feel like there's a lot of that in the air just this in your face problem where a solution or at least a, a recourse has been determined but then like within weeks it's the the old flawed policy is enacted or the flawed action is redone. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, I don't know why. Yeah, I think um, at least with school boards and stuff, I think it's a lot of um, public opinion of the community come in and will influence the people in charge. So even if people want to make the right decision, I think they feel pressured not to by a certain uh, mass ignorance or whatever the politics of your community are, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, everything has been politicized, every single thing. Uh, so that makes it complicated. I've been thinking about uh, how we're blaming each other for everything all the time uh, lately. And uh, as I don't know what it means. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, it just feels like everyone is, well, I just said, I said 
we're getting weird information from the government and the education system. There's a subtext there where I'm like kind of blaming them. And th- that's really spreading. Do you know what I'm getting at there? Yeah, we, you know, I, divide and conquer is the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> and it feels like they could, you know, by they, I don't even know who I'm talking about. I, I don't, yeah. I'm not a conspiracy theorist necessarily, but we're all volunteering for the divide and conquer. Hmm. You know, it, it feels like everybody's just digging in their heels about their issues. And uh, yeah, some of it comes from misinformation from the top or the level of um, uncouth ignorance that uh, is kind of giving everybody a permission to be uncouth and ignorant. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, but, but then it seems to come from all things. Like it just, we were creating an impossible situation, you know? Yeah. Again, that energy. And then that situation is either, I can't tell if the energy in the air thing that you alluded to, which I think is accurate. I can't tell if we're feeding that energy, if the energy is feeding into us now like it's confusing it's probably a feedback loop yes you know? yes exactly um yeah it's it's a hard one i mean you and i are not going to resolve this together today we're not <laughs> no we're not gonna we're not gonna save the world on the podcast today <laughs> afraid not uh i want to congratulate you on your first uh volume of poetry here uh it is called harvest man 23 untitled poems and collected lyrics is that did i have that right yeah, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So how far back does this uh, work uh, sort of stem? I believe it's about two decades worth of work, right? Well, the lyrics are definitely two decades um, decades worth. Um, and I, I have written poetry my entire adult life, but it's never been with the intent to publish it. It was always just kind of my own personal self-expression. It lived and died in my personal journals and mostly would become fodder for lyrics when I needed to uh, find words, phrases, lines that I needed to serve a song. Um, Mm. But uh, those 23 poems, those were all written last year, kind of in the, in the process of writing the lyrics for the new record. I had, I had stolen two lines from a poem. We have the sea and we will always have the sky. And the poem I took them from, I felt it was perfect, even though I don't publish them and or I hadn't up until that point yet. I felt extremely guilty about taking those two lines for the song from a poem, which would then be rendered useless without its two best lines. Um, but just to clarify, you stole a, you stole lines from a poem that you yourself wrote. Yeah. I plagiarized myself. Um, now, now how, how did that make you feel? How did both of you feel about that? <laughs> I, the one who wrote the poem and the one who stole the line? Well, I, uh, guilty. And, but the, um, <laughs> but the, the positive aspect of that was I had come to the conclusion that maybe I should write a, um, a series of poems with the intention of not butchering them for lyrics and not turning them into just a place where I go mining for phrases. And, uh, and so I sat down and wrote every day for a little while, uh, you know, at, off time at school or in the mornings before I left the house. And, and pretty quickly I had a group, including the one I stole the lines from, of about 23 poems. I thought, well, that's a great prime number. I'm into that number. Mm-hmm. And um, none of them have titles, so they seem like they're a related body of work. And I'm going to go ahead and let those two lines live in a poem and a song and they'll both, and then, then the idea of, you know, first I thought, well, I'll just go to Kinko's and make a chat book for friends or whatever. But then as I thought about it more, I thought, well, shit, I'm 50 years old. If I don't own the fact that I write poetry by now, when am I ever going to? And maybe, uh, there's an audience for it if I tie it into my lyrics and kind of make that connection and release it simultaneously with my, uh, my upcoming record, which is also kind of out of my comfort zone because it's a lot prettier than anything I've done. So I got these two kind of projects that are pulling me out of uh, m- m- whatever self-imposed expectations I had on myself and where my artwork sits um, and just kind of pushed my own boundaries, which felt like a good thing to do. Right. So the album in question is called No Wilderness Deep Enough, and uh, it's beautiful in my music library here, I find it striking that it says unknown genre. 
Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't know what to do with it, I guess. Or maybe I'm supposed to enter something in there. Anyway, uh, I'm curious about, you say you've been writing poetry most of your life. And obviously that, uh, you, you also mentioned that it maybe served as either fodder for or maybe even just a writing exercise for lyrics in the end. It, your poetry informs your your lyric writing. Do you have a sense of what first spurred you on to to express yourself in that way in particular because you're well regarded as a guitar player as a musician as a virtuoso in in many ways i'm just <laughs> curious about your culture or cultural or your rather your expression your creative expression i should say w- what sort of came first was it writing things down was it playing um it was it was definitely playing i mean i you know i i loved hard rock radio when i was a kid and and did what most of us that uh, came of age in the late seventies, eighties, kind of did, you know, f- followed that hard rock, arena rock, as far as it would take us, and discovered heavy metal along the way until punk rock came along, and then uh, you know that whole the whole DIY punk rock movement of the eighties is still where I feel I formed m- most of my values with regards to art and mm. uh, self expression and how art and commerce are related and all of those things. And, and, and the, especially the do it yourself mentality. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, so it was, it was the love of music at first. And then that, that drive that punk, the punk rock gave us that weren't the shredders on instruments or the trained musicians or the whatever that gave us the permission to, Hey, you don't have to be good. You just have to mean it. Right. You know, you, you just have to, uh, say it with conviction. And so, uh, you know, that started like, okay, well, I don't have to be as good as these guys that are learning their Eddie Van Halen riffs down the road. I was, I'll never figure that out, but I can bash out these few chords and, and really mean it. And that led to songwriting and creating our own stuff. And, you know, luckily being in a collective like Neurosis growing up where we wanted to kind of transcend our uh, teenage angst hardcore-ness and kind of blow it open into a more existential place sonically and emotionally than obviously lyrically that had to follow you know and yeah yeah young guys you know i was a young man in college i was uh getting a sociology degree and so i was reading a lot of psychology getting into jungian psychology getting into comparative mythology although i'd always loved mythology since i was a kid and, you know, that led to uh, a lot of different roads. The American Transcendentalists, Thoreau and hmm. Whitman and and um, reading Joseph Campbell and his books on comparative mythology and the hero's journey and uh, Carl Jung and and uh, all of that led also to poetry and philosophy. And I became very interested in, in uh, shamanic practices around the world, earth based spiritualities, pre-Christian spiritualities and just all of that kind of ended up in uh, uh, the blender of being a, a, a young, inspired man surrounded by other young, inspired people doing crazy stuff. And it, it just kind of led down this road, you know. So, I mean, some of the things you've just alluded to in terms of Jungian uh, psychology, uh, philosophy, uh, all the things you've been talking about, there are certain cliches around metal lyrics punk lyrics you know some are for sure fantastical yeah. th- like again i view them as cliches and i'm not trying to pigeonhole any genre i'm of- right there with you right i'm just curious though as someone who's clearly drawn to the written word did you find particular writing or writers even songwriters that spoke to you more in their explorations of rather you know whether it would be introspective psychology psychological expression or or a full-fledged exploration of mythology, if you will. Are there any particular writers or writing styles in punk or metal or rock music that particularly resonated with you and inspired you to to write? Well, I don't write prose, but I was definitely inspired by a lot of... I mean, and some are are also cliches in their own way. Jack London Mm -hmm. and his writing of the uh, Alaska and then the uh, tundra areas up there. He was huge. Oh, the Irish poet uh, Yeats Mm -hmm. was pretty big for me because he was also, he transcended that kind of being into his Irish heritage and the Celtic mythology, but also being very much a late 1800s kind of uh, 
a cultist, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so he went into a lot of weird spots. But um, uh, there was a native uh, activist, uh, a spokesperson for the American Indian movement named John Trudell, who passed away several years ago, who uh, combined poetry a lot on top of tribal drum songs and traditional songs. Mm-hmm. And I always found that really compelling because he was he was clearly a, a modern guy, a seeker uh, seeking to reconnect with his ancient roots and ancestry. Uh, that was very inspiring. Hmm. This is fascinating. Like I, I've asked you a song writing question and you're, you're alluding to kind of more, I don't know, cultural studies, anthropology almost. Uh, and as I read through this volume of poetry, I just, in my mind, I kept thinking, well, this, there's some real ex- existential stuff going on here. Um, a person trying to negotiate their sense of place in the world. I mean, within that, there's, I think, a lot of mortality stuff as well. I mean, that's all in there, isn't it? How lives are lived, why they are lived a certain way, where they're lived and why as well, and how they end. That's kind of all swimming around in your work, isn't it? Yeah, I can't seem to... uh can't seem to get out of that one. That seems to be the, the uh, and it doesn't matter. It could have been uh, neurosis since the early '90s uh, through all my solo work. Although it becomes, you know, more personal, obviously. Um, but it is. It's always kind of zooming back and forth between the micro and the macro. And mm. even when I know lines are specifically about personal relationships, or you know, even uh, you know, day to day trials and tribulations that we all go through. You know, I, I've just never been comfortable wearing it on my sleeve like somebody like Bill Callahan might or something, you know, or you, it's like almost too much information mm. about uh, what what went wrong in your relationship. You know, like I feel the need to hide behind a thick layer of uh, natural metaphor. Right. But then in this volume, in your latest records uh, and in this volume of poetry and lyrics, it feels like a bit of an outpouring, a revelatory outpouring. Um, do you know what? I think you kind of talked about the origin of why this collection uh, has been compiled on some level, but on a sort of deeper emotional level, like why? You, I guess you said it, like you're at an age where you feel like this, the time to do something like this is now, but is there anything else going on? Is there something? I know you're you're a parent, right? You're a, you're a dad? Yeah, my, my kids are... Uh... 21 and 18 they're all, you know up and out of the house so kind of right, completed but, that yeah, chapter yeah. but yeah being i mean as you know cuz you're there uh entering parenthood if you are any sort of compassionate thinking feeling human being that's going to completely change and reprioritize everything in your life mm-hmm. including your creative pursuits mm-hmm. Some people take it the wrong way and feel that, oh, well, now I have to be a grown up and stop doing my my band or what. <laughs> you know, yeah, sometimes. there's there's the- stuff like that, you know, but I think the kids need to see us do our inspired work, you know. Yeah, I, I think there's there, there's that stuff swimming around there, too. Kind of um, I don't mean to say vocational and I don't mean to apply vocational to a cultural I keep saying cultural expression, but I guess it is. I I, mean, I keep meaning to say creative expression, but I guess it's coming out as cultural expression. It's both <laughs> to uh, to take the, the load off me there. I guess what I'm getting at is I feel like at a certain age, you start to subconsciously contemplate your legacy and what about your life you want known. Hmm. And so I think when you're in a position like yours where you're, A lot of your life has been marked by records, Um, you know, the work you've done, the time, what you were thinking at the time. If you think of records, they're records, they're documents, they're documents of a time and place in your own life. In a sense, your your ancestors, like, or rather your, I guess, your your children, uh, the people coming after you, your family, have things that some people will never have. You know, we've all heard the cliches about, well, I went to the attic and I found this box from my great-great-grandfather that I didn't even know about. Some of us have been constantly making things and releasing them to the public. And, I mean, these days, Norm MacDonald has that joke about (laughs) how, like, back in the day, everyone had a single photograph of themselves. And now 
You know, if you want to, you can be like, do you want to see a photo of my granddad for every single day of his life on, <laughs> on my phone? <laughs> and so the, the way of actually applying some sense of yourself in the world has changed a lot. I just wonder if you came to a point where you're like, I kind of want something about me known and in sc- like to if my children want to know about me, they have certain artifacts and they have family photos and whatnot. But here is a thing I'm making that might not be for me now. It might be for them or other generations in my family. Does any of that make any sense? It, it does make sense, but I don't believe that any of that was any sort of conscious. No, I don't think drive. it's conscious. Yeah, because I, I think, I, I think you, uh, whenever I whenever I consciously try to do something, it it usually uh, <laughs> sucks in comparison to when I just sort of let something naturally evolve and flow flow through. But I mean, I don't know where the drive comes from. So maybe you've tapped on something that I haven't considered of that, uh, you know, um, well, when like you to- say, I, I, when you say I, I reached an age where I thought mm-hmm. I should do this, what do you, what is the subtext there? I reached an age is yeah, I, I, a I, contemplation just- that you're on the other side of something. I don't know. Life, ha- maybe. maybe half a century being 50. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see this as kind of a, um, the latest kind of step in my self growth. And I think both the album and the poetry book kind of speak to it is, and it's been, it's been, a, it's, it, there hasn't been a single revelation or a single, um, event which spurred this. I think it's been a, a slow step by step starting from the beginning way of getting here, but it, it's, uh, I'm learning how to get out of my own way and learning mm-hmm. how to put aside the voices of self doubt or, uh, self-criticism or imposter syndrome i'm who am i to think i'm can put out poetry like you know that, that's ridiculous you're not qualified you know the, <laughs> all, the, all these these voices in there which can stop you or, or or had i not been in a hallucinatory state of jet lag in my wife's parents house in germany when i first came up with the first simple yeah. chord progressions of the record maybe i would have intellectually skipped over them like what is that that's just two simple piano chords who cares right you know but it's it's like learning to trust that the process happens whether i'm actively seeking it or whether it's seeking me and i just need to surrender to it or i just need to provide the invite the conditions to allow the accidents to happen you know right okay yeah, that's fair. And I and I didn't mean to put something on you in terms of why you might be doing this stuff now. Uh, you mentioned the jet lag situation. You were in Germany uh for what was it to visit family or something like that? Yeah, my wife uh my wife is from northern Germany and so that's where my in-laws live. Hmm. And um the land where they live actually the exact house site where they live her family has been on that exact same house site for over 500 years. Wow. Uh, uh, you know, plowing that same land. And it's very different, you know, than uh, we are here in the kind of mountainous West, you know, like that land has been manipulated uh, for a long time. It is very cultivated. It's very heavy. And especially for, you know, even by old world standards of Europe, for one family to not have even moved across town for 500 years, <laughs> you know, is uh, a long time. Uh so there's huh. kind of a kind of a weight there, kind of a a density. Well, it it sounds like the opposite of restlessness. It sounds like a, a family uh, that knows itself, um, a people that know itself and know what they are. Yeah, it, it it's some you know I'm the I'm the child of the westward migrations. I my you know my family's never stopped moving, so it's it's interesting for me to contemplate. Like I think I have some sort of a deep unspecified longing to know what it's like to be that connected to a place. Yeah. And I feel like that comes across in your work. Would you agree? Like there is a general searching. It's like a, I don't know if it's restlessness, but when I, and I'm obviously I'm a, I'm applying an umbrella definition or (laughs) assessment of a huge body of work, but that's in your work a lot, isn't it? Um, This notion of questioning and searching for something. It's sort of undefined, but it's sort of wondering about 
what the here and now means in the grand scheme of things is that I know, again, that's maybe a generalized statement that could be applied to only almost any artist. But I do feel like that is in there within your work. Is that fair? Yeah, that's more than fair. Yeah, I, it, it's always been an, uh, a kind of um, an unspecified search, an unspecified longing, sometimes even an unspecified sadness. And I, I'm not thankfully, I'm not someone who, who suffers depression uh, or anything like that, but there is this certain melancholy aspect to this search for something that maybe doesn't exist or that I'll never know. Hmm. So that is, you okay, so you're saying it's not a, I think you're kind of getting at the fact that you're not prone to d- depression, so to speak, but when I read your lyrics and some of the questioning is really about, you know, what are we doing in these lives? And so... It gives me some pause having interviewed or or had friends who have raised these questions and not been able to reconcile them if you know what I mean. Yeah, um yeah. so you're saying you're you're okay <laughs> in your search in your searching in your questioning you're not self-diagnosed. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And you're not you're not in the you're not mired by this so to speak. It's just when you express yourself these kinds of questions are swimming around in your lyrics and even in some of this, like we haven't even gotten to the soundscapes of the new album, which are a little off kilter, a little surreal on some level. You mentioned some basic piano chords, but I don't really think of your work as basic in any way in the, in terms of the, the latest record. So yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just, first of all, I guess I'm checking in to make sure you're okay. Yeah. Um, which is, I, I, are you all right there, Steve? Everything's okay <laughs> as far as you, you're concerned. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And in okay. fact, I think uh, I, there are many people that are not. And so I don't like to make lo- light of it, you know, yeah. like I feel yeah. I feel very fortunate that w- whatever whatever it is that I confront inside myself, uh, I have artistic modes of expression in order to deal with in a positive manner. Right. And um, that in some ways those aspects which might be negative when you have a creative outlet then you can actually look to them almost as a positive wells of inspiration you know so in that way you have a sense of gratitude to be able to look deeply into those behind the curtain I guess so to speak I mean one of the things about your body of work is I I alluded to earlier to the fact that the, the new album is designated as unknown genre and I feel like from your time in Neurosis to Harvest Man to now working under your own name, that unknown genre thing is a big part of that, right? I mean, this notion of, of creating space for yourself, uh, whether it's in your bands or as yourself, to be free to do anything you want, that's a big component of your creative expression, right? Absolutely. And I, you know, that again, that goes back to the formational years of that DIY punk movement. I saw that as fuck you we do what we want we express ourselves in the most pure honest and emotionally intense manner that we can and it turned out that that was not true that it actually had to be narrowed down to a genre and have rules and Mm. (laughs) stuff like that and then you have to bounce around these ridiculous genres you know Um, yeah yeah post post punk post metal you know blah 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 whatever it is and 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 so maybe it even transcends that 80s time I was talking about. It just goes back to all all art, music, and poetry, and and maybe even the, uh, here I go getting freaking existential again, but maybe the uh, origin of all language is our need to talk of something deeper, more honest, more original thinking, something beyond shelter me, feed me, reproduce, you know? Well, yeah, there's a certain resistance to convention that occurs in almost every aspect of life. Like I, as you're speaking, I'm thinking back on like when I was in university, I took a, like a intro to jazz 101, like an intro to jazz history class. And there was this point that struck strikes me as being relevant to our conversation where uh, a cohort of jazz musicians to, to separate themselves from swing and mainstream jazz they coined the phrase bebop 
And it's kind of like what happened with rap music and, and hip hop. And I kind of think that punk became commodified and then it became hardcore. And then when that became commodified, it became post-hardcore. And so <laughs> there's always these, these artistic resistance to the genre signifier, which I think is just a resistance to the marketing and, um, I don't know, mass appeal that gloms on to a, a true expression. And I've gone on a bit of a tangent here from what you were just discussing, but I, uh, that seems to be what's you guys have neurosis have been called post metal. What the hell does that mean? It means don't you're even, not metal. Yeah. Don't even know. And that, well, in fact, I, so in reacting to what you just said, I'm looping back to when you first asked me about the songs, like what writers influence you. And one thing that popped into my head, which I didn't say, but now it's circled back to you, is like, okay, so if all these genres like have no meaning, where do things sit artistically? And I think, okay, well, when I think about lyric writing, I can put Rollins era black flag right next to uh, Dylan. Once I realized that he wasn't a flowery hippie, that he was actually super intense poet, you know, with, uh, who, who rebelled against that whole closed minded world that tried to embrace him with his folk material. And, uh, you know, still, still doing that. If I might say, <laughs> I, and went very well, I'm a hero. So, you know, I, I so like, yeah. you know, Dylan and Patti Smith can live next to black flag. Joy division can live next to the American transcendentalists. Uh, it, to me in a genre that, uh, of art and music and poetry, which exists, in a more uh, more related to each other than things that might next be next to them in the record bin. Yeah, and that's kind of how I process music and culture myself, and that's evident maybe in even the guest list on this particular podcast. Like, I don't... I'm looking for things that are true and real and feel true and real to me. Yeah. And it sounds to me that you are doing the same in your own expression. And I've started this line of conversation just to get at the distinction you make between your work in neurosis and this work that you've been doing on your own. I mean, I feel like you all created this space where you could explore other interests beyond that, that sort of pop more, I guess, core expression. I mean, people will say, Oh, the guy from neurosis is on this podcast, but right. at the same time, there will be other people who say, Oh, the guy from Harvest Man is on this podcast. Like you've created these <laughs> these worlds of reception for yourself. I guess first question: What is the sort of status of neurosis at the moment? Um, well, luckily we didn't have any plans for this year. Once we got uh, once we got home from last year's tour, uh, we kind of we're kind of in let's go back and recharge mode, and then everything shifted. So okay, just kind of holding pattern. Yeah, so it's a going concern. I just wanted to try to figure out if any, if its status or its activity dictates when you express yourself as yourself or as Harvest Man, if you will. Uh, is, there, is there a connection? I know it's a, it could be a downtime versus what have you thing, but you've created the space for yourself probably for a reason. And I'm not trying to suggest that neurosis doesn't give you a place for this, but you recognize that they are kind of different expressions. What actually prompted you to think, I have this stuff that doesn't fit that, it doesn't fit neurosis. I need to make it, make something of my own. Beyond Sonics, what was it? What was it exactly that made you feel like you had to, you wanted to do this? It, it goes back to learning that lesson of, um, of uh, I guess I would call it honoring the muse, getting out of my own way, not talking myself out of things and, and, and allowing that creative spirit to push itself to the forefront when it needs to. So, so it's more specifically in uh, the late nineties, I'd always had home recording equipment since high school and mid eighties. I had cassette four tracks, um, graduating to reel to reels. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and now I'm sitting in a room with way too much stuff um <laughs> digital but, recording and whatnot <laughs> yeah Synthesizers, probably guitars amps yeah all of, yeah. yeah right so it's always been a thing that i like to do and, and there was a point in the in the late 90s where i was living in the mission district in san francisco and i had found myself recording a lot late at night like you know when you live in a beehive city like that like the world isn't quiet until 3 a.m mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I found myself recording all these very subdued, 
acoustic guitar, almost whisper voice uh, songs, and with no intention. I had no project. I wasn't writing them intentionally. Hmm. I just wa- I just wasn't stopping them from appearing. And uh, when I realized I actually had a whole body of work that had no home, it clearly wasn't neurosis music, which was more of a group kind of meat grinder process where all five of us have to be constantly destroying and rebuilding things, uh, following this kind of energy that's greater than, than greater than us as individuals. Right. Right. You, You know, so this was, this felt very personal. And so I thought, well, shit, I guess I, the thought of coming up with another band name was, awful because that's probably the worst (laughs) position anybody would need to find themselves in right is thinking of a band name so i i guess i thought okay this is personal i'm just going to release it under my own name and that's how as the crow flies my first bit came out they were just quiet songs recorded in my bedroom uh when the world was sleeping and that just the the process of putting that out there went okay now i have this pathway now i have this thing that felt very uh necessary to express and now i've given myself permission to keep following that pathway kind of that's kind of how my poetry book feels now like okay now i finally done it Hmm. now i can't now i have another pathway of of creativity that i can pursue publicly you know that i can i can put out into the universe there and that that feels feels worthy of occupying space a kind of basic perception of what you're describing is that your your solo expression is something of a, I don't want to say reaction to your work in neurosis, but it is a complementary form on some level, or it's different. Um, and on some level, being in a loud rock band might inform someone when they decide that their other expression is going to be sort of the opposite of that, if you will, like whisper vocals, quieter acoustic guitars. Um, tell me what you make of that. But also I'm curious if your work as a solo performer and writer has informed what you bring back to neurosis. Um, I'm just curious about the, the, the parallels there, I guess, or, or how the two worlds meet. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I mean, I guess if you looked at my record collection or what I listened to my whole life, I mean, you would, you would be able to pick out the neurosis influences, you know, the Joy Division, mm-hmm. Black Flag, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, that that stuff. But, you know, you'd also find uh, Buffy St. Marie albums and, and Bob Dylan records and Low albums and Brian Eno albums, you know, all these different things that have influenced, I would say, neurosis as well, just because I think everything in our kind of way to try to even though we do constantly get pigeonholed in our way to kind of blow those doors wide open for ourselves within heavy music i mean it's still heavy rock it's still guys yeah. yelling at you with loud distorted guitars but i think we 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 had perceived that everything you see feel or 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 hear will influence it in some ways whether they're movies books uh, media or hopefully life itself bringing the original factor and, and the authenticity of your self-expression to the table. But I, mm-hmm. in how they're complementary, I think, um, yeah, maybe there was a desire to do something. I mean, obviously it happened. I, it wasn't cerebral. It was uh, just on a gut level. So maybe there yeah. was just this impetus to, yeah, to, to do something soft and no, hopefully no less intense, but that you can be intense with, with quiet, somber, beautiful music, just like you can with heavy music, and uh, sometimes more so, actually. And, well, they can uh, be. I, I've I've read people talk about how those kinds of oscillations are sort of physically motivated. I think uh, I feel like the story around Neil Young's album Silver and Gold is that he got back from a Crazy Horse tour, so his voice was pretty ragged in a, in a way, or it had a tone to it just from singing every night or on tour. And so he came home and made a quiet record, relatively quiet record, and just kind of liked the way his voice sort of sounded all messed up. Like it it didn't quite sound like him. It was a bit, you know, worn down, but it also had an interesting tone to it. So there's that relationship between his loud voice and his more quiet voice. And they're totally physically, you know, there's like a visceral connection between the two. 
And I guess I just wondered if that's sort of swimming around there. Like you get back from a neurosis tour and on the one hand you need to rest, but on the other, you're like, I have things I need to say and sing. Um, is that, is that the case with you in any, in any way? I think that may be, I mean, again, not consciously, but that makes total sense when you're saying, it. I think the, you know, when you get home from a tour of, uh, loud, heavy music, the last thing you want to put on is loud, heavy music. Oh yeah, you for know? sure. I mean, you talk to, <laughs> you talk to bands who have been on tour lately and I've talked to so many who are like, we don't even listen to music in the van. We listen to podcasts. We listen to comedy records. We don't listen to music because we're just, it's music, music, music all the time. Exactly. That, that, that's probably why on tour i i don't know how many hours i've got logged into uh two album like brian eno's on on land mm -hmm. ambient record and uh, stars of the lid tired sounds of mm -hmm. i i probably have more hours logged into those two records uh from plane flights and bus drives than uh any other records in my collection just because they are gentle <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh, i've been talking about this with people of late uh just the physical toll i alluded to this when i was uh interviewing elizabeth powell of land of talk that Guy Picciotto from fugazi made a point of telling me that like as much as he you know probably misses playing in fugazi he doesn't the physical toll of being in that band and touring in that band left him kind of physically destroyed like singing every night kind of tore up his voice in a way and and the physical the, the the amount of exertion that those guys put into their shows got to him uh not to the point where i think that's why they ceased but he made a point of saying like to be honest like it was it's it was harder than maybe people recognize yeah when 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 you choose and i i think we would relate to that because one thing that fugazi did that i feel we do in our own way is we feel that when you, when you're playing music with that level of emotional intensity i it feels disingenuous to not physically embody it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, like, yeah. like you wish you could kind of stand still and not give yourself whiplash or, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you know, and, uh, I'd like to be able to put on my best Billy zoom face and stand there and rock it, but that's just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't happen for me, you know? And, and it, it, yeah, it can, it can tear you up. And those guys, those guys gave 100% plus well, for sure yeah i think the mental energy of of um i i yeah it's just we've I, this time this pause the suspension in time i hope is giving people a bit of a chance to just think about what we do and how we process things like that band and, and your band i'm sure is the same like there's a lot of intricacy going on in terms of remembering lyrics remembering complicated guitar parts uh as you say doing all of that while being sort of conscious of being a performer like the physical aspect of this isn't the sound check this is the show people came to see a show i've got to do all those things like i've been watching some uh early, late 90s fugazi concerts on youtube and just watching someone like Guy play these weird guitar parts while singing these intricate lyrics <laughs> tunefully and it's mind-boggling like i'm like what a freak that guy was and i didn't even know <laughs> i didn't think of it every time i saw them i didn't think twice about it but now that i've just sort of thought about our general physical and health like our states of being that's like a lot of what's going on like we're thinking about our mental health a lot thinking about our physical health a lot and so when i look at things now i kind of think about that like how is that human being physically flying through the air to dunk that basketball and what is it like the next day like i'm just having these thoughts in my head so i can only imagine with you you must a lot of ice packs after neurosis shows what was going on uh, yeah for sure <laughs> ice and nursing injuries and yeah uh you know but i, I it's funny to mention it because over the last bunch of years you know despite the fact that and, and people might have anything to complain about about touring i mean Really, the last decade, I've tried to just look at it with an immense sense of gratitude that any mm. chance I have to be able to travel, to make music, and anybody else gives a shit about my weird form of self-expression <laughs> yeah. is f amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, the chances of that being possible, I, I have nothing but gratitude for it. And my body is used to, you know, because I'm, again, being an elementary school teacher, most of my touring time where I'm free, I mean, occasionally I can take small bits of time off of work and do long weekends or 
what have you and i've always had support to do that you know like, yeah hey sorry sorry i've got to go to holland for the weekend and it's going to take me four days to get there and back you know but um i can feel in my body now that it's august that i have not been on tour this summer <laughs> like <laughs> yeah like I, I, uh, i've got uh, a restless physicality uh sitting there and, and usually i mean i don't i don't have um I don't, unless I'm making music or recording in the studio or whatever, I don't usually play a lot of guitar unless I'm getting ready to, to write songs or creating songs or rehearsing songs. But I, I have felt the need to, to stay up, um, late for the last couple of weeks and just do BS learning of, of, of Led Zeppelin songs or whatever on, on things I don't know how to do just to keep my fingers yeah, moving. Otherwise yeah. it'll be like an entire year of not moving my fingers enough. Right. You know, like, yeah. it, and my, even though I have no reason to, I've, I've reverted into being a night owl. Whereas usually throughout the school year and every other time I, I'm an early riser and, you know, up, up at four or 5 AM taking care of business and early to bed. But I've completely flipped. I think just because my body thinks I should be on tour right now. Right. Like I'm on a year, yearly cycle. <laughs> yeah. It's like a muscle memory thing happening throughout your entire body. Yeah. 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 Um, what I didn't ask you this and I meant to, uh, you're an elementary school teacher. What grade do you teach? What do you teach? Fourth grade. So that's nine year olds turning 10 and, uh, everything. You know, when you're a classroom teacher, it's reading, writing, math, right. science, okay. history. Yeah. Okay. So you're a general teacher. My son is just about to enter some version of the fourth grade. I, oh. we, we're not sure if it's going to be <laughs> online or in person. Virtual I, fourth grade. Good luck. Yeah. They've told, yeah, yeah. They've told us, uh, by the way, that it, it, there's going to, they're dividing the year into quarters. Um oh. Semestered quarters. And you have the choice of either sending your children to the school uh, or doing virtual learning, which will encompass uh, uh, classroom amalgamation among schools across the city, which uh, we just found this out, and I don't exactly know. Interesting. So it's what that's it's gonna... two options. So far, I mean, they'll monitor things, but they haven't really said what happens when a child or a teacher gets sick with the thing, <sighs> and so I'm leaning towards let's sit the first quarter out and see how things go. <laughs> let's sit out November, September, yeah. November. We'll do that virtually. And then, because as you would know, as a teacher, I'm sure that we've all been talking about, I'm surprised it's only the second wave at this point, but everyone's talking about what the second wave will, will be uh, looking like. And uh, I don't want to take a chance in spreading this into our community and, and also my family getting sick. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's thing, a rare, so. rare time. Like there truly are no good options. No, um, no, I'm trying to, uh, I went, I said this to someone the other day, I went through this with my, when my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, they told us exactly what was going to happen over like a five or six month plan. But, but we were panicking every month, even though everything they said was going to happen was kind of happening. And then by the end of it, you know, thankfully she's okay at the moment. She's okay. Like it, 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 it everything they said over that was going to happen happened and we didn't listen. And so in this case, I've tried to apply what I learned a, a year or two ago to this scenario where all the epidemiologists said, we're looking at, you know, 16 to 24 months of this. Um, and but as you know, Steve, every week there seems to be a shift in that or like maybe we'll get the vaccine now and maybe it'll work. And I'm trying to apply the patience I didn't to my mother's situation to this and sort of say we have to all just ride this out and. But I, I don't know. Is that are you able to cope that way or like to, to be patient with this? I, I guess it's we're forced into it. I mean, <laughs> it's, there's, it's there's, I mean if, if, if we're it's, impatient, we're only torturing ourselves. <laughs> it's really a lot easier said than done. I don't mean to be glib, but I am trying to say because people around me are panicking and I have panic. And I oh, just for am, sure. Yeah, I'm, tr I, I'm trying yeah. not to uh, put it out or convey it into the world too much. But to me, I'm like. I'm going to listen to the doctors and the experts and just say, we've got a couple of years of this like this. And yes, like all my in-laws and everyone's like, but the children are going to suffer uh, from the social isolation. And I'm like, yeah, but at least they'll be alive. I mean, I, I'd like us all to survive this. And then again, it sounds, it's a much simpler to, it's much easier said than done, but I, I know there's a mental health toll here. 
And, for sure, uh, for sure, and, and for every co- every family has its own complications, you know, with that yeah. those scenarios. I mean, um, I don't know what your guys' situation is, and if somebody can be home, uh, we're home. We're home. My wife yeah. and I are working from home, uh, which is fortunate. We have uh, very, very, we're very fortunate to have these white collar kind of jobs, uh, and uh, I'm trying to view this as a bonding exercise, but it is. It's difficult. We don't have a lot. We don't have a lot of space to ourselves and time to ourselves, and that's an issue. But I'm trying to view it all as bonding time. Yeah, for sure. And 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 then there's those families where both parents have to go to work. Yeah. And they don't have, uh, you know, they've got uh, lower lower working class jobs, and they have to uh, leave their kid who may or may not for whatever reason be the ones that need school the most yeah <laughs> you know yeah. maybe yeah. they're maybe they're already behind right you know and and those kids are not going to be able if there's no parents home are not going to be able to interact and engage well with an online model uh, you know i mean high school kids maybe but not i mean elementary school kids i think it's very difficult especially if it wasn't taught to in advance with a plan, you know, and we're all kind of like chasing our tails, trying to find resources that don't entirely suck. But I, I just noticed from the last few months of last school year that the ones that needed it the most were not getting it. Fair. You know? Yeah. And sorry, I think you already said, the, said this at the, at the beginning of the chat when this was sort of alluded to, you don't actually know what your work year is going to look like yet. Do you? No, it. uh, Basically, they've they've divided it into four phases. I'm sure this is similar everywhere: green, yellow, yeah, orange, and red, based on community spread within our immediate community. Now we're in an area where it's been relatively low, but because Idaho was early to open up and open up completely, everybody's on vacation here now. Mm. <laughs> right, right. So, so, uh, you know, we'll see. So we're kind of guessing that we're probably going to start in yellow, which is a regular model with social distancing four days a week instead of five. But I honestly have no idea how they'll pull it off because I have 32 kids registered in my classroom. And if you have social distancing, you can fit 16. So, yeah. Yeah. uh, you know, again, and, I, I, I'm, I'm trying not to blame my wife is kind of like stupid government. And I'm like, I don't, I, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of the government here, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not just, I'm not in a, I'm not, there are people to blame. There's blame to go around, but I'm just not, it doesn't help me deal with it too. It doesn't solve anything. Yeah. No, I, I, there are going to be villains in all sorts of scenarios. And a lot of them are the ones who are politicizing this and that part I don't like, but I'm also like, honestly, I don't think anyone exactly knows what to do because they don't like the, what the epidemiologists and experts are saying. So they deny it. And that's, yep kind of human nature i'm anyway sorry i didn't mean to uh <laughs> yeah. sort of come it's, to the it's, end it's, of this talk it, with this grim it's, it's the chatter. world it's the world we're living in you know and yeah and uh again I'm, I'm thankful to be able to have uh creative outlets and to be able to have opportunities to talk have interesting conversations about music and art and poetry with people yeah and uh when uh a lot of people are in panic mode and glued to the media and uh emotions and and things are running high and so i think to to take a moment and and acknowledge what is good on this earth uh and that we are human beings and that we are uh extremely resilient by our very nature um we just need to remind ourselves of that and and we just need to have have the eyes to see the positivity and the ears to hear it and the, and the voices to speak it amidst all the, uh, the chaos. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with you. Um, in terms of future plans, I mean, we've just, we're talking about this volume of poetry. We are talking about your new record. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to, to help us find that stuff and, and tell us where to go, uh, online or wherever to, to get these things. But you also, uh, are you the principal, operator of uh, new rot rec- recordings that's your label yeah. yep i mean the band kind of oversees what we do artistically but it's always for the last 20 years been run out of my house and uh i got a couple of folks that help me out with it a, a, you know a label manager to do the day-to-day grunt work while i'm busy at school and people to help us with uh, 
social media and and uh, we hire the PR outside. But yeah, it's all basically run on the other side of the wall from here. <laughs> so I, I guess within what I'm getting at here, future plans for you, uh, future plans for Neurosis, it sounds like everything's on hold at the moment, but any releases or anything else you want to tell us about uh, in terms of Neurot recordings or, or other things? Uh, Neurot recordings, we have a pretty interesting release coming out. Obviously, we've been working really hard on my record, which comes out we're speaking on a Thursday. It comes out tomorrow. Yeah. Next month, we have a um, project called Deaf Brick, which is a collaboration between Deaf Kids, uh, a really interesting band from Brazil that we've been championing championing for the last uh, couple years. Uh, just really powerfully inspired young guys playing a really unique, uh, intense type type of music. It really. Uh, really is incredible so the deaf kids have, have collaborated with uh, a band called pet brick mm. out of the uk which is igor cavalera of sepultura oh. and uh and a guy uh a guy from another noise making project there in london and uh they kind of do strange glitchy electronic uh stuff so it's kind of mixing these two worlds it's really intense I, i'm i'm proud to put that out into the universe it's collaboration with rocket recordings they're doing it in the uk we're doing it here okay um other than that uh really it, it it's just kind of been wait and see what's going on <laughs> you know right. uh i had had uh, like everybody i had to cancel my plans to tour this record and promote the book live this summer so hopefully those opportunities will represent themselves next year at some point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, I don't know is a fair thing to say a lot these days. So don't, don't feel bad about <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, yeah, uh, that, I do not know. <laughs> I don't know. If anybody knows, let me know. <laughs> so where would you send people uh, who, as I say, if we want to, to guide people to find uh, your record, your book, uh, new route recordings where would you send people for these things uh, vontil.org uh, for my stuff and uh, new route recordings uh, they you'll both end you'll end up at the same stores right for both right. but uh, you'll get different information at, at the head start of it so that's that's where to find me okay cool now if we can go out on a piece from uh, let's say no wilderness deep enough which would you first of all tell me if that's okay Secondly, what would you select? That's absolutely okay. Um, <laughs> Appreciate that. Maybe one that hasn't been out there yet. Maybe uh, Trail the Silent Hours. Trail the Silent Hours. Now, why did that come to mind? Why did you want to pick that one? Because just as we were talking about kind of, uh, and again, these words written weren't written this year. They weren't written knowing what was ahead of us. These were just, they, a lot of times words can take on a new meaning almost like uh, reading tea leaves or pulling a tarot card uh, in order to kind of reframe your life in the future you know they, the meaning becomes clearer later mm. but there's just some lines in that that kind of make sense to right now like um, confusion carries us through the night we, we will always stumble in the dark uh, and then it ends stand then as an oak holding ground Seek shelter and surrender, but don't give in. Yeah, that is a, it is very powerful and it is very, well, I guess it's prescient in a sense. There's a lot of this going on, I feel. I've been speaking with artists who have written songs before this that weirdly seem to anticipate <laughs> uh, scenarios that they weren't even contemplating. Um, but I think coincidence and reality have an interesting relationship uh, in our lives absolutely yeah okay well that's yeah i uh, that's a great selection this is trail the silent hours from no wilderness deep enough um, steve thank you so much for making time for being on this show and being so thoughtful with uh, your this conversation and your work it means a lot and i wish you the best of luck with everything going forward yeah thank you vish really appreciate being on the on the show
very special thanks to Steve Von Till for being on this, the 561st. Five, yeah, 561st. Is it 561? That's a lot. 561 episodes? I think that's correct. Yes, he's on the 561st episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One podcast network, and uh, it, we're available on all Apple and Google platforms and other things, too. Oh, of note, we are no longer available on Audio Boom. We've had a long relationship with Audio Boom, but we recently switched our RSS feeds and everything else is fine, but Audio Boom's like, you're switching your feed? Get out of here. So I'm like, all right, fine. So no more Audio Boom. So if you used to listen to the show on Audio Boom, boom or if you know anyone who does, just tell them we're not there anymore, which is sad, but what are you going to do? It's podcasts. It's just podcasts. Nothing you can do. It's podcast land. Podcast town? Why am I quoting Chinatown? If you can't find an episode of the show that you're looking for, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi-regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. Uh, you can follow uh, Creative Control on Twitter at vishcreative or follow me directly at vishkana. Also visit patreon.com slash creativecontrol to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Uh, having uh, we've got some new people who have donated to the show they've signed up for the monthly stuff thank you for doing that patreon.com slash creative control for more info about how to do that thanks again to live at masseyhall.com where you can watch beautifully captured concerts by some uh, really great Canadian artists there also thanks to Pizza Trocadero the bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show uh, as always thanks to my friend Jim Guthrie for lending me some music for this show you can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org 
And finally, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode with Steve. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you've not heard the show before, I hope you will consider digging in uh, to past episodes uh, and uh, maybe following the show, however you follow things or subscribe to them or whatever it is you do. Maybe talking about the show with your friends. That seems to help when people say, hey, did you hear this sh- the thing? And the other friend says, the what thing? And you have to be more specific. And then you explain it a bit more and they say, oh, Oh yeah, okay, I guess I'll check that out. Just remind me. Can I can you make a group calendar reminder so that I can remember to check that out later? And you say, What? I'm telling you now, why isn't this enough? You need me to God, you are annoying. And then your friendship breaks up because of my podcast. Anyway, that's it for me. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.